Glad you're all here. Um, we're going to talk about The Last Temptation of Christ, a book that has gotten, um, well, it's one of the most banned books uh, in America and actually around the world. And we'll talk about why that is and everything else. Um, but I'm going to give you a quick, quick background with uh, the author, Nikos Kazantzakis, a uh, nice Greek boy. Born February 18th, 1883 in Heraklion, Greece, uh, Crete, when it was still actually part of the Ottoman Empire. Um, he died trying to get home from China in Germany, actually, on October 26, 1957. And then, sadly, thanks in large part to his book, The Last Temptation of Christ, he was buried in the walls of the city because he was not allowed to be buried in a Christian cemetery. Um, the Orthodox didn't excommunicate him, but they refused to actually uh, let him get buried in a better space. Uh, he was nominated a staggering nine times for the Nobel Prize for Literature, and he actually lost out by one vote to Albert Camus in 1957. Um, he wrote in Demotic Greek, which is basically the local Greek, um, and usually with actually uh, some Crete vocabulary as well and versions. So between the two, few outside of Greece ever heard of him because not a whole lot of folks in the world know Greek, much less Demotic Greek. Um, and it wasn't until almost his death when many of his books were translated and published uh, in the Western world. Um, as a result, he made his living publishing Greek travel guides, um, some of which have actually won prizes for literature, believe it or not. He wrote... He wrote a number of Greek travel guides, and they were thought so highly that they gave him, I can't remember what the Greek prizes are, but he's won multiple prizes for his uh, books. So there's a picture of him in his later years. Most Americans know him better um, because in 1964, his book, Zorba the Greek, was turned into an Oscar-winning movie. Most people know his book there. Um, he literally wrote dozens and dozens of plays, travel guides, articles, books, and he wrote, the, the main things he's known for are The Odyssey, a modern sequel, Zorba the Greek, The Last Temptation of Christ, and St. Francis. Uh, and there he is at his younger age, uh, younger years, looking a lot like Zorba the Greek, actually. So, he was a brilliant man. He got his PhD in France at the Sorbonne, and his dissertation was... Frederick Nietzsche on the philosophy of right and the state. Um, themes of alienation, loss, and existentialism would dominate his work in ways similar to Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, if y'all don't remember that sort of cable of writers, they're all dealing with basically from World War I through World War II, this great anxiety in the system. What does it mean to be human? What are we doing? Why do we keep killing each other? All of that anxiety seeped into his work as well as Camus and Sartre's. Camus very darkly, Sartre's pretty darkly. Cousin Zakas with a little more hope, actually. Um, they were all dealing with all the fallout, and really they're also dealing with Nietzsche. So we've got to talk about Nietzsche for a minute. Mm, one of our favorites. Uh, he's known for declaring three big things. God is dead. Uh, he's known for what's called passive nihilism. Or basically, there's not any meaning in the world, and we're just sort of stuck, and we have to deal with it. Nietzsche, yay. Um, known for will to power. Uh, he understood humanity as a struggle for existence, and basically the, his idea, and, and I'm not great with the philosophy. If someone here has a degree in philosophy, especially Nietzsche. Um, but basically, Nietzsche believed that if we believed it and really fought for it, then we could affect it and do it in the world. This idea that you could, be, you could will yourself into power. Um, there was a young military sar uh, sergeant in World War I who believed this particularly, um, who believed that the will could conquer all and could change the world. He went by the name of Adolf Hitler. Um, he was convinced that you, if you just believed something strongly enough, no matter how off the wall, you could affect it. And actually, in many ways, he did. Um, he's also known for the Ubermensch, or Superman, a character who will create new values in our system. Basically, our world was a mess. We're all nihilists. Things are existential at best. But a lot, we need a new Ubermensch, Superman, to come along and help us find new meaning in this broken and messed up world. 
Mm. Nietzsche. So, with those in mind, we have to have these things in mind because this is actually, again, this is his PhD. Kazantakis' uh, PhD was on this fellow. And if you're listening, you'll hear echoes of Nietzsche throughout all of his books, but especially um, in The Last Temptation of Christ. So, he chooses to wrestle with themes of alienation and lost and call in The Last Temptation of Christ. And basically what has happened to this book is uh, the focus has gotten all on, focused on this moment where Jesus marries Mary Magdalene and has children and all these different things like that. People get very upset about Jesus not being celibate, I guess. Um, and so the book has gotten slammed for that kind of information, but it's only the last two chapters of a 33 chapter book on the topic. He spends a lot more time elsewhere, as always, sex sells or upsets, and so people worry about that more. What really happens is, and the reason why the uh, Orthodox Church gets very upset, and rightly so probably, is the tension is between Jesus' humanity and his divinity, as we'll see in just a minute. That's where he really tears into our gospel text. It maybe makes us question some of it. All right, so what are the temptations of Christ? Y'all, y'all, y'all know these. What, what were the three times he's tempted in the desert? What happens? That's right, turning stone into bread. Jump off the temple and worship Satan. Those are the three, right? <clears throat> um, and Henry Nowen, I love these definitions. He calls them the temptation to be relevant. To be powerful and to be spectacular um, is what he calls those temptations. I love that particular frame of reference for those. But those are the three temptations we know of. So here's the thing. What is the last temptation? It's biblical, actually. Luke, after the temp, the temp, uh, all, everything happens with Satan, we always just go, oh, Jesus won. He beat Satan and all temptation is done. When really, we know this is not how the world works. Temptation comes constantly. And if you look in the fourth chapter of Luke, 13th verse, when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Until an opportune time. Okay? What is the opportune time, you might ask? Well, um, common interpretation comes in Luke 22. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. Satan explicitly comes in for the moment when he decides to betray Christ. So what's the last temptation of Christ? Biblically speaking, it's not completely clear, but it's basically the concept of Jesus was betrayed and at any point he could have stopped himself from being crucified. That would be the last temptation of Christ. Biblically, and actually, it's also exactly where Cousin Zacchaeus understands the last temptation to come play, come into place, okay? That, that it's all in that moment at the end. So the idea is that some portion of those final 24 hours is the last temptation where Jesus could have stopped the crucifixion at any of a number of points and chooses not to. Questions about that? That's sort of, most, most folks, this is a little bit of a surprise. Does it make sense if you think about it? Okay. So, um, Kazantzakis ultimately crafts a far more different, difficult temptation. Um, instead of it just being one thing, he has this idea through the entire book of Jesus being tempted over and over and over again. Jesus doesn't get off with just three quick temptations and one at the end. He's, well, human. Completely human. That's the critique that the Orthodox Church has against this book, is Jesus does not know pretty much at any point that he is the Christ or the Messiah. He's just not in his brain. He is really, just like any of us, in a very difficult situation. Um, grammatically and uh, literarily, he uses terms like uh, the boy or the young man or the son of Mary, a variety of ways to talk about how he is growing into uh, God's perceived command to be the Messiah and to sacrifice himself. Um, he's not a self assured, got it all figured out Messiah. It's just not what you're going to find in this book. Um, so, he uses language to great effect. Oh. 
Uh, like I said, he says, young man, boy, the son, Mary's boy. Jesus is actually not referred to by name until about, uh, I think it's about the 10th chapter, so about a third of the way into the book. Until then, he's this unformed guy who's just wrestling with God. And God, in turn, is actually portrayed here as a bird um, who is tormenting Jesus, who constantly is scratching and pecking at him, pushing him to figure out what his call really is. Um, It's not a particularly positive view of God. But then the more challenging thing for a lot of Christians is his best friend in the world growing up as a kid is this guy by the name of Judas Iscariot. It's his best buddy who's constantly trying to help him along and figure out what's happening. Um, It's a fascinating role. The person who is sure of what's going on in the world as a zealot, as a Jew in a broken world is, is Judas. He's positive that they need to throw off Rome. He's positive they've got to fix this stuff. He's positive that God is with Israel. He's positive that better days are ahead. Jesus, on the other hand, is wrestling with everything. Everything. Um, so here's a fascinating exchange um, that they have in some of the earlier chapters. What happened to you, Judas asked? Why have you melted away? Who is tormenting you? The young man laughed feebly. He was about to reply that it was God, but he restrained himself. This was the great cry within him, and he did not want to let it escape his lips. I am wrestling, he answered. With whom? I don't know. I am wrestling. So in that quick exchange, you get this really clear idea. Again, Jesus is having a hard time, but the character in Kazanzakis' world is wrestling, is fighting with every ounce of this, and what does it mean to be who he is? Um, ultimately, Jesus is a pretty pitiful character in this book, pitiable. He is this guy who is wrestling constantly, he's unsure of what to do, constantly put into difficult positions. Um, he even starts out the book where Joseph, his father, the carpenter, and Jesus build crosses. That is their job. As carpenters, they're pressed into labor to build the crosses that they execute all the other Jews that are rebelling on. So, um, in one devastating scene, we can see the faith of Kazanzakis. And this is a pretty amazing thing. I mean, when you consider, um, and I'll just preface it really quickly, we know the story of Jesus, we know how this all works, but this is a, this is a master author playing with what we know of the crucifixion, what we know of all this understanding and playing with it in a very different way. What would it be like to actually grow up in a world where the cross is not a rare thing, the way we tend to think of it, but an everyday thing? And that's what we understand historically. Jesus, any Jew in the first century saw crosses all the time with all sorts of Jews hung on them as a reminder that Rome was in charge. So what might that have actually looked like or engaged? So here's the scene. Um, Peter is talking, he's looking around, watching Jesus, who has made a cross and has actually been forced to carry it for a person who has been condemned. So here was Mary's son passing in front of him, loaded down with the cross, while everyone spat on him and pelted him with stones. As Peter looked and looked, he felt his heart become roused. His was an unlucky fate. The God of Israel had mercilessly chosen him the son of Mary, to build crosses so that the prophets could be crucified. He is omnipotent, Peter reflected with a shudder. He might have picked me to do the same, but he chose the son of Mary instead, and I escaped. Suddenly, Peter's roused heart grew calm, and all at once he felt deeply grateful to the son of Mary, who had taken the sin and lifted it to his shoulders. Let me help you, he said, You are tired. The image at the beginning of the book is Peter carrying the cross for Jesus, who's been forced to carry it for another criminal to the top of Golgotha. A fascinating way of playing with images that we know by heart, but turns it on its head at the same time. Peter, who in time will deny Christ when the moment comes as well, but in this moment is actually compassionate and realizes what an unbelievable burden Jesus will one day care. So, 
Jesus is caught in God's call. He's wrestling and resisting. And he doesn't want to do what Jesus asked. He wants a normal life. Um, great exchange. A uh, rabbi comes to Jesus' house and says this next line, Jesus, my child, how long are you going to resist him? Speaking of God, the entire cottage shook with a savage shout, until I die. Um, Cousin Zacchaeus is a brilliant fellow, and he plays with what we know of crucifixion throughout the book in ways like this over and over again. It's absolutely about the crucifixion. Um, it's about what does this really mean? What does sacrifice really mean? And it's just, um, it's a fascinating piece of, of work. Um, I read the book uh, the first time about 15 years ago, right before I went to seminary. So obviously it resonated with me enormously as someone struggling with call and trying to figure out what I was trying to do with my life. If I was to be a priest, if I should be doing whatever. Um, so it speaks, uh, it spoke to me enormously at that point of what does this really mean? How does this really work? Um, and getting ready for this class and rereading large ch- chunks of it, um, it struck me in a different light, of course, we in a different phase of life. It struck me much more in this sort of process of where does free will come in? There's those questions of, you know, Jesus almost seems condemned to have to do this kind of life. Um, but it also, the thing that I remember then and now is the brilliant terms of phrase. I mean, this is a true master author, master writer, who just has terms of phrase that are indelible. Um, one that I remember, and I couldn't even find it this time, but I remember from reading it 15 years ago, so that gives you a good idea of how good it was at least for me, how much it stuck in my brain. There's terms of phrases that he uses that are so indelible, they can suck, suck in your head. In my case, um, at one point he talks about um, the Jordan River, and he says, the Jordan River, God's holy artery, just these kinds of magnificent little phrases, God's holy artery, Jordan. And you're like, yeah, that is sort of how that world views um, Jordan. It's right before Jesus gets baptized in the book. Um, so, this is a, this exchange, the next exchange is between Jesus and John, and we all know the story, the traditional sort of exchange between Jesus and John, um, he sort of sees him coming and says, oh, I, I don't deserve to untie the thongs from your sandals, you are the Messiah, you're ready to go, and there's just sort of this automatic deference. Um, Cousin Zacchaeus preserves that. But he actually preserves what's probably a little bit closer to what I would argue the truth might well be. The tension between um, the two, between John, who's been doing this work, and Jesus, who comes in with a pretty different message. Um, And again, Jesus at this point still isn't sure he's fully the Messiah. He's just trying to figure it out. But he's made a choice to engage the call and to go out into the desert and and to be part of this life that God seems to be calling him to. So last night, I examined you, John says. Smelled you as though seen for the first time, but I could not find peace. I looked at your hands. They were not the hands of a woodchopper, a savior. Too soft, too merciful. How could they swing the axe? I looked at your eyes. They were not a savior's eyes. Too full of sympathy. I got up and sighed. Lord, I murmured, your ways are dark and oblique. You are capable of sending a white dove to burn up the world and turn it into ashes. We watch the heavens expecting a thunderbolt, an eagle, or a crow. You give us a white dove. What is there of questioning of, what use is there of questioning of resisting? Do what you like. If you were the one I've been waiting for, he said, you have not come in the form I imagined you would. Was it all for nothing then that I carried the axe and placed it at the root of the tree? Or can love also wield an axe? Heavy, profound stuff. Good, good stuff. Um, so Jesus goes out into the desert. Um, and one of the themes of the book, again, is this division between spirit and flesh. Um, it's really how... Uh, Cousin Zacchaeus understands a great deal of Jesus' temptation as well as Jesus, uh, well, as a character, I would say. It's probably the best way to say that. 
And so the division between spirit and the flesh, God is the spirit, the flesh is of the world. That's pretty much how he defines it, and it's probably how a lot of us at times can engage this idea of two different parts of the body. Um, But Jesus does not come to the myriad temptations offered in the book. Instead, he goes out to proclaim a God of love and the spirit. So in the book, Satan is tempting, and he understands the temptations all in very physical terms. So turn this rock into bread, Jesus is saying, okay, actually, I'm not real hungry, it's okay. (laughs) Um, And throw yourself off the top of the temple, and he's like, that would hurt. That's a physical problem. Um, And he understands all of those in physical terms. So for him, it's not too hard to resist as he tries to focus on spiritual things, but he focuses on love and the spirit over and over again. And in the book, again, the first probably 20 chapters are Jesus wrestling with if he should even go into ministry or if he should even respond to God's call. He finally does. We have the exchange with um, John the Baptist, who's really skeptical of Jesus, and if he's actually the Messiah, he wanted somebody to come with fire and brimstone and fix everybody up right. And Jesus, of course, comes in peace and love, and he's not really sure what to do with it. And so Jesus goes out, um, even in just a handful of chapters, with very much that same idea of this radically different love, this radically different model. Um, There was one great story here. Yes, here it is, that I did not type in. Jesus teaches to the crowd. He's teaching, this is just an idea of how Pazanzadis tells the gospel story, but he tells it in a way that is a reimagining so we can hear it again. Because if he just sort of told the story of, and now the Good Samaritan, you sort of turn your brain off even if you're reading it. Um, because we've heard this story so many times. Instead, he tells completely different stories. One of them is a fabulous one. Uh, the crowd starts getting angry, they're getting frustrated because Jesus isn't teaching the rebellion that they want him to teach against the Rome, uh, against Rome and all the evil forces oppressing them. So this man presses and presses until finally this happens. Jesus smiles. He said, Old man, once upon a time, there was a marble throne at the eastern gate of an important city. On this throne sat a thousand kings blind in the right eye, a thousand kings blind in the left eye, and a thousand kings had sight in both eyes. He called God to appear so that they might see him. But all went to their graves with their wishes unfulfilled. When the kings had died, a pauper, barefoot and hungry, came and sat on the throne. God, he whispered, the eyes of man cannot bear to look directly at the sun, for they are blinded. How then, on them to one, can they look directly at you? Have pity, Lord, temper or strength. Turn down your splendor so that I, who am poor and afflicted, may see you. Then listen, old man. God became a piece of bread, a cup of cool water, a warm tunic, a hut, and in front of the hut, a woman being sucked to an infant. The pauper stretched forth his arms and replied happily, Thank you, Lord, he whispered. You humbled yourself for my sake. You became bread of water, a warm tunic, and my wife and son in order that I might see And I did see you. I bow down and worship your beloved many faced face. Great story, isn't it? And it's a great, again, this sort of gives you this idea. Kazanzakis never, ever wants to have God as this pure spirit ethereal. He wants God in concrete flesh forms. Jesus is flesh. He's constantly caught up in this human existence and doesn't really give a tar about the heavenly side of things. He's wrestling with what it is to be human. Um, this continues all the way through the book until we get to the part, the last temptation of Christ, the parts that get all folks all kinds of upset and worried about. Um, two things happen. One, Judas, who's been his best friend, has been pushing him the whole time to rebel, to work. And actually, Judas, who to his credit in the book, begins to understand Jesus' love, and that love perhaps can be a conquering force, begins to shift. And what happens is um, they get to this end, to that last supper sequence, and he has to ask Judas to do the impossible. He asks his best friend to betray him. 
And what happens next is this devastating scene. So he turns to his best friend Judas and says, betray me. And he says, Rabbi, I won't be able to endure. And he says, you will, Judas, my brother. God will give you the strength as much as you lack because it is necessary. It is necessary for me to be killed and for you to betray me. We too must save the world. Help me. Judas bowed his head. After a moment he asked, if you had to betray your master, would you do it? Jesus reflected for a long time. Finally he said, no, I don't think I would be able to. That is why God pitied me and gave me the easier task, to be crucified. On the cross, Jesus... So anyway, so there's that... I mean, that, I'm moving on too fast there. Um, but it's this fascinating turn where Jesus knows what's happening in a way that we don't expect. And it starts to question who has the harder role in all this process. Was it Judas or Jesus? One of the many reasons the Orthodox get upset because it really starts to put questions in your mind about the story, about what each side is about, what's going on. Finally, the last temptation comes. This is the part that gets um, people very upset. Jesus is crucified. Judas betrays him. He can't handle it. He kills himself, um, which breaks Jesus' heart. He recognizes what's going on with Judas, and it, it crushes him as well. Um, and then on the cross, Jesus has a vision of a different life. He's, he's on the cross, but he has this moment where he is tempted. Um, it lasts the last couple chapters. And he has this image where he comes down from the cross as they mock him and say, if you were God, you would come down from the cross and save yourself. He does. He comes down from the cross and imagines, I guess, what that was like. He embraces Mary Magdalene, who is waiting patiently at the foot of the cross, and they has a normal life and gets married. The part that Kazantzakis does brilliantly is he makes sure that it's a normal life. They have about two years of happy marriage and they sit and dies, even in the temptation. Life is still life. It doesn't work out perfectly. And then Jesus turns and marries both Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, who we actually heard about in today's gospel, he marries them, they have lots of children, he lives to be an old man, and in one of the, my favorite moments in any text anywhere, Jesus is this old man, he's got a couple of kids, and he comes across this young firebrand preacher who is talking about this gospel of Jesus Christ from Nazareth, who is crucified and resurrected for you, and how you need him in your life. And he walks up, and it turns out to be Paul, who is preaching about Jesus, even though Jesus didn't die on the cross. And they have this fascinating exchange where basically Jesus goes, I don't know who you are, which as a guy who does not always love Paul, I particularly love this idea of Jesus sort of looking at him going, what are you talking about? But the fascinating thing is, Paul says, even if you didn't do it, even if you are Jesus and you didn't offer yourself on the cross, we still need someone who saves us this way. And I'm going to keep preaching. It's at that moment Jesus realizes this is all a temptation, that he's still on the cross, and he makes a choice instead to go back, to reject that final temptation to have a normal life. He realizes that the world needs this sacrifice. He needs, the world needs someone to invite him into God's life in positive ways and changes. So, the final two lines of the book, sorry I don't, I'm giving it away, but <laughs> the final two lines of the book, Jesus uttered a triumphant cry, it is finished, and it was as though he had said everything has begun, setting into motion all that would come after the love, the highs, the lows of the church. It's ultimately a book of enormous faith. It's a book that is connected, um, but it's key. So, now here's the key objection to the Orthodox faith. Jesus didn't choose to be the Christ. This is where people get really upset. They get upset and they think it's all about Jesus um, having marriage and having kids that the Orthodox Church and most Christian groups get upset about. It's not what they actually get upset about. What they get upset about is a heresy called adoptionism. That is that Jesus was just sort of this human who came along and did really nice stuff. And then God said, wow, because you're doing so great, you can be my son. Um, and the Orthodox faith, absolutely not the case. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And our God loves us. Um, 
the idea can't be pure heresy to say that sort of Jesus came along and did it the other way. That said, um, and, and Jesus is co-eternal, he always exists and will always will exist. Um, that, that's the idea that they typically are objecting to, is again, that heresy of adoptionism, that Jesus was just a human who did really well and then got adopted into God's life. Um, So what the Orthodox miss is what Kazantzakis is actually doing in the text. He's working to refute Nietzsche, if we go back to that beginning. Um, he wrestles with the idea of nihilism and the will to power and all that stuff that Nietzsche is peddling. And he ultimately goes, yeah, no. No. The will to power is submission of our will to God's will. The will to actual service in the world is giving ourselves to something and someone else, not... I get to be in charge and take over everything. The complete refutation of Nietzsche. And he casts Jesus as the ubermensch, even though that's who Nietzsche is rebelling against explicitly. He's saying we need to get rid of all that Jesus stuff and have someone who comes along and finds real meaning. And instead he says, no, no, no. Jesus is that guy because he chose to love even in the midst of hate and battle and all the things that they're rebelling against, all that existential stuff that even in the first century, they were trying to deal with in a broken world. Um, all right, there. Boom. That's a whole lot. Thoughts, comments about Kazantzakis, about uh, temptation, Nietzsche, anything. Any, 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 any questions? You know, it seems to me, um, and I wonder, I have read the book, mm-hmm. if he speaks to our common belief that Jesus growing up as a human, but yet was without sin. Right. And then presented himself as the perfect sacrificial lamb. Right. Does he talk about his, Jesus' perfection? He, does, he doesn't necessarily reference Jesus' perfection as one without sin. What he does, uh, the question was really sort of asking about how Cousin Zacchaeus presents him as one without sin as the unblemished lamb. Um, Kazantzakis makes very explicitly what we tend to do implicitly that is um, there are three very powerful scenes where the scapegoat which is one of the ancient traditions of Israel comes in where they would literally get a goat put all of the sins of the community on it literally and figuratively in a variety of ways and then cast it out into the desert in a way of casting out the sin um, and there are two or three moments where the scapegoat these scapegoats show up and Jesus realizes, I'm the scapegoat. I am the lamb without blemish. I am the one who is being asked by God to take on this sin. Um, Jesus at no point is really, he never succumbs to sin, but he's not necessarily declared as one without sin. Sort of, so he, he preserves that within, his, uh, within the text. But it's, um, it's definitely a challenging way of doing it, mainly because Jesus is so much more human and he gets tempted so much more often. He resists every time. Um, and that part of our tradition is absolutely preserved in this book. But it is fascinating because it's probably, at least I would like to believe on some level, more of how his life actually worked. Just, he got up and it was to be easier to do this than it was to do this, but he always chose the right way instead of that little white lie, that problem that um, we saw with being a little less honest, those kinds of things. I wonder. I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. I wonder how he his perspective on uh, Jesus' baptism, um, because I felt like that was when Jesus the veil was lifted and the shade was lifted, the door was open, and God or, or, or Jesus realized that he was the Son of God. That right. I, he did, the question is about baptism, about um, the baptism moment, if that was a moment in the book uh, where Jesus sort of realizes who he is. It is in the book a little bit more of that moment, and it's actually a far more fantastic baptism moment than we have recorded, because pretty much Jesus gets baptized, he comes up, and the other says with the voice, you are my son, I love it. Um, all of that's part of it, but it's uh, this more fantastical moment where the fish start to swirl around them in a sort of whirlpool and leap in the air, and there's a little bit more of a sort of all of nature anointing Jesus moment in the book. And Jesus comes up realizing something more is going on in his life. So he realizes it, but he's still human and gets sort of doubtful about, like, 
I'm pretty sure nothing more is happening, but he also sort of does that natural human thing that we all do, even when we have an idea of, this is what I'm supposed to do. How did this person do it? And now, you know, that sort of back, and there's still that tug of humanity, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm wondering how this uh, book shaped or, or informed your faith, and I guess the corollary is, uh, how should it inform ours? So this book uh, actually informed my faith in just thinking of the story in different ways, and about the eyes. Most of the books I've read before, um, this one were like Bishops, uh, the, last, the Day Jesus Died, um, those kinds of books that were very much, here is the story as you read it in the Gospel, here is the story as um, tradition has held it. So then to turn around and read this book, Cousin Zaka's book, which is very much a challenge to traditional understanding, um, it doesn't actually take any verses and refute a verse, but just to have Jesus and Judas be best friends is a challenging idea by itself. Um, and the idea that Jesus had to turn around and ask his friend to betray him because he knew he had to die is an enormously challenging idea. Um, for me, that's a very freeing moment in my faith and my understanding of Scripture that there are different ways to look at the text. The text is not fundamentally changed. Jesus is still betrayed by Judas. But an idea that actually... For me, it makes almost more sense in a way if they were all, here are these 12 people he spends day after day with. Yeah, of course they were his friends, and maybe Jesus was more in control or had more things going on than we think. Doesn't mean that I believe definitively Judas was or was not Jesus' friend. I don't know. It just helps me to think of the text in new ways, to open my mind to different ways to look at some of the stories, um, some of the ways that we understand our faith. Um, in particular with this one, the idea of a very human Jesus who struggles with everyday temptation and not just an occasional three times in the desert temptation is comforting, um, even if it does challenge a little bit of orthodoxy. Um, those are, for me, that idea, and what I hope you all would get from, uh, from this, or if you read the book or any book, there's a whole host of them that sort of do this, is to healthfully question our faith. That is, to look at it in such a way that we say, okay, here's what I understand in my faith. Clearly this is rubbing up against it. Which makes more sense? How do I understand God? How do I understand Jesus in this? Um, and, and how can I um, move forward with maybe a, a, deep, a deeper understanding of Christ without it necessarily being one that tears down, tears apart uh, my faith, but hopefully builds it up to that questioning, to that, to that challenge. And that sounds like um, what I was just thinking, that Cousin's office had a very, very agile and creative mind. Absolutely. And that he's calling us to have the same yes. uh, in the way we view anything is to keep asking the deeply Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't agree that. John is saying that this is the invitation is that you use our minds creatively in the same way thousands of us did, is to, to think about our faith in those creative ways and challenging ways and constantly opening ourselves. Um, it's easy to get lulled to sleep because we think we know what a verse means. Thousands of us reminds us that sometimes we need to, to dig a little bit and look underneath and think in different ways about that verse. And it is helpful to realize we never know what a verse means. No, we never know what a verse means. We only does. think we do. Mm -hmm. We think we have an idea, and then one day we read it a different way, and suddenly it's all upside down, for sure. Right. One last question. Well, I'm just curious how many of you in the room saw the movie version of this. Because it came out in the. Yeah, Scorsese made a movie. Yeah, it's a great, great controversy. And I, I've sent you an echo about not seeing it, but it was clear to me. I think the main reason was because there was actually a sex scene between Jesus and Mary was the part that really got people upset more than anything else. Um, but again, 
people were focusing on the wrong part of the temptation as always, instead of, instead of the things that actually were the challenge. Um, that is, why couldn't Jesus have a normal human life with the temptation is all the thing Jesus wrestled with? And it also plays to the point that we've always seemed to measure on the mind. We do major on the mind all the whole time. Right? In, in our spiritual walk and as we read the Bible. Amen. We're inside out and upside down. Yep, we can get there. Well, we got a baptism coming up. Um, thank you all for being here. And